All right, this morning's sermon, I want to go over very, very simple um, doctrine, very simple answers to people who are going to criticize why we believe what we believe or, or the things that we believe. And there's very few, there's, there's basically just a few things that will come up all the time when people hear the things that we believe. And it's usually, it's not just the, it's the vast majority of the stuff that we believe isn't controversial, isn't something that's going to get people upset, right? Lately, obviously, ref I'm, I'm referring to this week with the news story that was aired on TV about how, you know, we could be this hate group and, you know, this tiny church here, we're, we're, this, we're this extreme hate group that, uh, that doesn't love anybody. We sit around hating all day and, uh, and that's what we do, right? We're on this list of being a hate group. And um, to a lot of people, it's shocking, right? And what I want to gear this sermon towards is the Christians out there. And I mean Christians, people who are believers, people who are saved. Because people who are unsaved, they can't receive the things of God. I don't care if they go to church every week. I don't care if they call themselves a Christian. If they're not saved, the natural man receiveth not the things of God. They need to hear the gospel. So this sermon isn't geared for the unsaved. This sermon is geared for the really watered down Christian that doesn't know their Bible, that has been brainwashed by the world, and just has really bad doctrine. Now, this sermon is really geared for you to help you to have all the tools in one place to be able to answer the Christian as to why you know, what they're repeating is completely false. Because every time something like this comes up, you're going to get one of the same arguments. And if you followed any of this on social media, you'll see it's always the same things. So I'm going to go through point by point of what were the most common things that people say, right? From love the sin or hate the sin, right? I would see that maybe once or twice. Or um, judge not, right? I thought you're not, you're not supposed to judge. These are things, and there's a few more. We're going to get into all of those. There, there's about three or four just, you, you just see this, you know, the woman taken in adultery. What about that? You know, he's without sin, cast a stone, love your neighbor as yourself. And it's just these platitudes, these things that people just want to throw out there because that's all they know. That's all they probably ever hear. And it's just grossly taken out of context. They don't even understand. If you were to ask them, well, where does the Bible say that? They'd probably say, I don't know. Where does Jesus say to love your neighbor as yourself? Well, I don't know. They can't even turn to it, yet they just know it. We want to be able to battle that ignorance with truth. And we want to do so in a loving way in a humble way, but in a way that, uh, you know, they could see the errors of their way. There's, there are rebukes that are needed from people who are going to side with homosexuals, with sodomites, with people who hate God over Bible-believing Christians that love the Lord, that preach the gospel to every creature, that do their best to go out and teach all nations as Jesus commanded. There's a, you know, there, there is a, a very, very big problem with someone who really is a believer, who really is a child of God, that is not siding with their brother and sister in Christ over God-haters. Now, I just want to start off by saying this, though. Even though there is this big mouthpiece of the media that can make things appear however they want them to appear, don't be deceived into thinking that what they say, their perception of the world is reality. If you read the news article or, or heard it, they said that we were this tiny church and they're really trying to downplay 
oh, there's only about 50 members, and it's this really tiny church, and it's just, we don't know, we're, we're, they're the first of this kind to be in Georgia, to anyone who's ever said they actually believe the Bible. I mean, do you really believe that? Do you really believe that there is no other church in the whole state of Georgia that actually believes God's word? That actually believes what the Bible says about sodomy? I'm sorry, I refuse to believe that. In fact, the whole reason this church started is because there were people in Georgia already that believed this stuff. They already held these beliefs, so it's not like I came in and we're starting a cult. <laughs> and we're focused on the sodomites. And that's all we're going to talk about. And we're going to sit around and just hate the sodomites all day. No. No. What's funny is that if people would just look, we post all of our sermons online. How many times has this subject really come up? Now, it comes up a little bit more frequently in general because of the society we live in, but still, is it, I mean, are we hearing about this every single week? I hope not. I mean, you better tell me if this is something that's coming up every week because I think we're a little lopsided then. No, I don't think it's coming up every week. We do Bible studies where we go through chapters of the Bible and that's all we cover is that chapter. We're going through the entire Bible we're preaching the whole counsel of God. And when you do that, you come across subjects that offend people. And they want to focus in and be like, well, you're a hate group because of this. Okay. There's no reasoning with people like that. But see, the media can take that and portray that. And you, you know, there's, there's a lot of things in that, in that story that I think they did a pretty good job of. They didn't, they didn't take my words out of context. They didn't misrepresent our beliefs. So I don't have a problem with that. That was great. I actually appreciated the fact that they didn't misrepresent us in, in what our stance is, what the belief is from the Bible. I mean, there's no Bible verses included, but that's, uh, you kind of expect that. But one thing they did do was downplay just in general what we believe. And they're trying to make it sound like this is unique to Georgia. Because they did say, you know, we had all these views on the internet and stuff like that, which that's true. But if you think those views are only from people outside of Georgia, they're crazy. This isn't, this isn't something that's unique to this area. And, th and that is a misrepresentation. And in fact, I received, and, and I was even a little bit stunned by this, I received way way, 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 way more support than any hate at all. I could go through my phone and the messages, I got calls, I got emails, um, you know, messages on Facebook. Hey, brother, I'm standing with you. Hey, I'm a preacher in Georgia. I'm a pastor in Georgia, and I believe like you believe I'll stand with you. Hey, I live a little farther away, but if you need me to be down there with you, I will stand with you. These are the words of people living in Georgia. It's not just us. We just happen to get the attention. We just happen to get the spotlight shined on us. But if you actually want to tell the truth, there are a lot more people that believe the way that we do. But you know what? The media doesn't want you to know that. Because what they've done with the sodomite, with the homos, is blast how much of a, you know, how big of a group they are. And overemphasize and make you think that they're everywhere. Oh man, there are so many sodomites. Oh, this is a huge portion of our population that we need to just, you know, cater to. That's not it at all. They're like one to two percent of the population. Yeah, you have your pockets where the cockroaches all like to gather together and huddle together, and you might see a lot of them in those areas. But in, as far as percentages of the populations go, there's not that many. They, they, they try, but you know what? You would never know that by watching TV. Why? Because they're in every stinking episode of whatever show you're watching. And they're just pushing that agenda. And that's what they want you to think. And they want to scare you into thinking that if you speak out about this, 
you're going to be shamed and no one's going to want to do business with you and you're going to, you know, you're going to be shut down. They want to scare people and unfortunately a lot of Christians are buckling under the pressure. But it's, it's false. Now look, I know that the majority of people aren't saved, but the majority of the people are not reprobate. There is a huge difference there. The reason why I'm even bringing all this up though right now is because I want everyone to understand that you are far from alone in your beliefs on this. The devil's going to want to make you feel like no one else believes this way. We're in this tiny church. There's, you know, no one else agrees with us. That's not the case. Now, let's say it were the case. Well, if it's God's word, it doesn't matter if everybody's against you. Yea, let God be true, but every man a liar. It really, you don't have to have a majority of people agreeing with you for something to be right. That may be the way the world operates, but that's not the way that the truth operates. Truth is truth. There's no arguing with it. There's no, well, I agree with it, therefore it's true. That's like the people who say, well, I don't believe hell's real, so it must not be real. Well, no. No, there's facts. I mean, it's either real or, or it's not. It, it has no, the, the reality of hell has no, co your, your belief in it has no consequence on the reality. Your support of it, no matter how many people believe it's a real place, it has no impact on the reality of it, on the truth that exists. So the truth of God's word, how God feels about sodomites, it doesn't matter how many people agree with you. But even though that, that is, that's true, that God is still right, there are way more people than, than the media is going to want you to, to realize actually agrees with what we believe in here way more people and it's growing and the reason why it's growing is because there is pushback finally from people who are not afraid who are not going to buckle and a lot of people as we've been seeing with Gideon right we just read that we just went over that story on Wednesday a lot more people are going to join up when you finally have someone willing to stand up and say what they already are thinking in their hearts but they just don't know how to come out with it or they don't they, you know they're maybe they're a little intimidated or afraid to come out and say things publicly but deep down that's what they believe too and they've just been waiting for someone to just be like hey we believe the lord we're gonna cast down the altar of baal and now they're all on board and i think people have been waiting for someone to stand up and just be like we're sick of this perversion I don't want to cram down my throat anymore. We're going to go back to God's law. And even people who maybe weren't right on this before and would say, well, we just need to love on them and everything else. When you got someone standing up and just showing you what the Bible says can say, well, you know what? Actually, that's right. And we just need to go back to what Scripture says about it. One of the top responses I've received, and we're going to go through a lot of Scripture. We started off in Matthew 28. One of the top res responses that I saw from people who were criticizing, right, not, not people in support, people who were criticizing, said, Jesus came to die for our sins, so you should preach love only. And they're saying that since, since Jesus came to die for our sins, we shouldn't be preaching what we preach about homosexuals, about sodomites. Well, first of all, we started off here in Matthew 28, because this is known as a great commission from Jesus Christ. Let's reread here in verse number, nine, uh, verse number 18. The Bible says, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Now, we preach the gospel, and we do. We do that here, actually, at this church. You know, people who want to tell you, oh, you just need to preach on the love of Christ. You need to preach. We do. They don't even know us. They have no idea what we do. They see one clip and one soundbite on the news media, and they just want to run off and start rebuking you, telling you why you're so wrong. They have no idea what we do here. I guarantee you that we are doing way more than any of these critics ever have done in their entire lifetime. We do more in one week. 
to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. We have multiple soul winning times. We have about four soul winning times every single week of people going out to find the lost and to preach the gospel to them and to preach the love of Christ and the love of God and to show them how Jesus Christ loves them, died on the cross to pay for their sins, and that all they have to do to be saved is put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That is happening, that is being preached here way more than anything else. Why? Because we actually, we actually believe the Bible when Jesus said to do this. We don't just bring up the Bible when we want to be as hypocritically tell other people why they're so wrong, but then not do it ourselves. These hypocrite Christians, and again, I'm, this is geared towards the people who I think are actually believers, are actually saved, that need to hear these messages, or at least need to see, you know, from Scripture, why they're wrong. Why they need to repent. Why they need to get right with God. Amen. Because they've been brainwashed. They've been duped into doing nothing and thinking that they're super spiritual. When Jesus said, not only are we to preach the gospel, he says, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded. That's not just, you know, Jesus taught a lot of things. In fact, why is it that you think he was crucified? Do you think it's because he was just saying we need to love everybody? Who is going to stand for that? If you have a person that says we just need to love everybody, we need, I'm love and we need to love everybody, who is going to allow for that person to be put to death? You, you answer me that. How does it make any sense that Jesus Christ was nailed to a cross and people were ridiculing and mocking him and spitting on him and beating him and whipping him? All because he just said, well, we just need to love everybody. That's not what happened. Jesus testified to the world that the works thereof were evil. That's what the Bible says. That's why the world couldn't receive him. Because he's of the Father. The world re receives the things of the devil. And those are all the evil things. Now, uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3.16 says this, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And the argument that we've been receiving specifically, because the whole point that people have a problem with is where I said, you know, the sodomites should be eradicated. They should be put to death. And that's the stand that I take. That's the stand that I will take uh, because that's the stand that the Bible takes. That's what God's law says. And that's what ought to be done. And the argument that, that some people are giving, that many people are giving, that I shouldn't say homo should be put to death is because Jesus died for the sins of the world and that everyone is a sinner. They said, I'll repeat that. The reason why Homosexuals should not be put to death is because everyone is a sinner and Jesus died for the sins of the whole world. By that logic, we should have no laws. Zero laws. No punishment, no crimes, no laws. Hey, you're a sinner. Jesus, Jesus died for our sin. So why should we punish any crime? Why should there be any laws? Hey, Jesus... Well, he stole from me. He needs to be punished. For no, no. Hey, he's a, you're a sinner too. And you know what? Jesus died for our sins. Hey, this person killed my brother. Well, he, you're a sinner. Your brother's a sinner. He's a sinner. All sins the same. Right? That's the other thing. We want to say all sins equal. We'll get to that in a little bit. A little bit but why should we have any laws? Hey, hey, who are you to judge that guy that killed your brother? Who are you to judge? I guess we shouldn't have any laws then. Now, who here thinks it's a good idea to have laws in a society? I agree. I think it's a good thing. But people get so emotional. <gasps> you, you think they should be put to death? Yes. Because I think we should have laws. 
I think having laws are a good thing. Well, don't you know that you, the laws of the Old Testament? <laughs> New Testament, no laws. Again, we'll go back to just having zero laws. Just do what you want. That's not what the Bible teaches at all. So let's step through this now. Because I think, I think the vast majority of people would agree that having laws in the United States of America is a good thing. That yes, we want to have laws. And we want to have punishment for crimes based on the crime. Not one standard punishment for everybody, but based on what is done, there ought to be a consequence. Okay, now I know we're breaking this down real simple. I don't want to talk too fast either because it's a very complicated matter that we're dealing with. Somebody has to come up with laws. If we're going to have, like we would say, okay, laws are a good idea. Well, now the next question is who decides what the law is going to be? Well, you can say the majority of the people should decide what a law is should be okay but does that make it right now that may be a way of creating laws and enacting laws that, that that is a way of doing it you can do it that way but does that make it right does that make it moral if you have a group of people that says it is okay by our laws to kill somebody, does that make it right? Well, of course not. Because there is a God in heaven that decides right from wrong. Shouldn't we be getting the basis or the foundation of our laws here on earth based on what God says is right and wrong? Wouldn't that make sense? Is there a Christian today that you could say, I believe the Bible, I believe God's word, I believe the Lord in heaven is God. And I believe that God determines right from wrong. And you're going to stand here and tell that to my face, but then say, well, we shouldn't have any laws that actually follow what God said the law should be. Where is your authority? Are you just going to go with the times and just say, well, that was a long time ago. We shouldn't do that anymore. Why? And, and this, and I just want to make sure we're clear. People get so blinded by thinking that what well, you just hate because they're different from you. So you just want to hate people because they're different from you and you're ignorant and you just don't like it. No, that's not it at all. The reason why I think homosexuals should be put to death is because that's what God instituted in his law. And I would like to live in a place that follows God's word as a pattern for our laws. Because I love God and I love the Bible and I think that he knows more than any man knows on right and wrong. So when the Bible gives these judgments, that's what they ought to be. And people today will look at you like you're insane and crazy and you're extreme and in this minority when it really, if anyone who knows history at all knows that this isn't even far at all from what societies have enacted in the past and not just in the nation of Israel, but even going back to the United States, sodomy has been against the law for a really long time. It wasn't until recently that it was actually taken off the books. Now, it may not have been enforced very much, but it was early on in the, in the early days of the founding of this country. People all want, you know, the same Christians that want to say, oh, we're a Christian nation, right? The founding fathers were Christians, and, they, you know, this is the work of God. The same people that, that want to tout that all day long are going to be ignorant to the fact that they don't want to look at, well, what were the laws really like? In the colonies what were the laws really like in the early days of the United States when it was supposedly founded on God's Word or through the providence of God why don't you look at those before you start saying how crazy we are in the New Testament days and you know it's you know, that was so long ago well you know what the people who you claim to be the righteous people started in this country 
had laws on the books against these things. It was a crime. And it wasn't because they're, oh, they just don't understand. Love is love. <laughs> yeah, our science and technology has taught us so much about the sodomite that this concept, well, they just love someone, never occurred to anybody that maybe, maybe it's just that they love each other. I know that so many people want to put forth the notion that, you know, a hundred years ago or two hundred years ago or a thousand years ago, people were just cavemen banging on rocks. <laughs> love, oh, no love, oh. <laughs> But that's, that's a fallacy. It's not true. They understood what love is and they understood what perversion is. And they understood when God says something is worthy of death because it's that bad, they believed it. And when you see the predators that are out there defiling children, and you see these perverts, they are perverts, and they cannot be healed. It is not something you can be restored from. A reprobate that once you're rejected, that's it for you. Once you're born of the devil, once you are a child of Satan, there is no being unborn from that just as much as there's no being unborn from being a child of God. There's no hope. There's no remedy. And there's absolutely no denying how God feels about the subject of homosexuality in Scripture. I'm going to blow through these verses because I'm on page two of seven in my notes, and I don't want this to be a marathon day all day long. The whole point was to try to give you, in one sermon in one place, a lot of places that you could reference to the ignorant believer that just repeats what they've heard and doesn't read, doesn't think critically, and doesn't stop down to sit and think about this. And, and this is why I bring up the point that if we're going to have laws, then how do we do it? What if you were in charge of making the laws for the country? What if that came on your shoulders? How would you do that? How are you going to determine what's right and wrong? Well, you know what I would do? I would go to God's word to determine what's right and wrong. And oh yes, all of God's word. Old Testament, New Testament. I would look at all of it and get it in context. But I think a really important context is going to be, hey, when God decided to establish a nation and give them laws, that's going to be my starting point. Here's what he established. And you go through to the New Testament and see, well, were there any changes made to this law? What were those changes? Jesus said, there shall in no wise, not one jot or one tittle shall fail from the law. In the New Testament, They'll all be fulfilled. We'll get into that in a minute too. But just the subject of homosexuality in Scripture, I've got a bunch of Scripture references for you. I'm just going to blow through these. Uh, you could write them down if you want. You know what most of them are anyways. Leviticus 18.22 says, Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is abomination. So there's, there's a command just saying, don't do it. Leviticus 20.13 puts a punishment associated with it. If a man also lie with mankind as he lieth with a woman, both of them have committed an abomination. Again, that word's repeated, abomination. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. It's their own fault. Their blood's on them. They, they commit abomination. They should be put to death. That's what the Bible says. Genesis 18, verse 20. And the Lord said, Because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous, because their sin is very grievous, all sin is sin. Well, wait, then why does the Bible say their sin is very grievous? As in, it's exceeding grievous. It's worse than others because their sin is very grievous. And it's not, it's not very plenteous. It's very grievous. What it, makes, it makes God really sorrowful, not just a little sorrowful very grievous. It's very grave. It's very serious. 
I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it, which is come unto me. And if not, I will know. And then, of course, in Genesis 19, God destroys Sodom and Gomorrah with fire and brimstone out of heaven. First Kings 14, 24 says, and there were also Sodomites in the land and they did according to all the abominations of the nations, which the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. Again, Sodomites, abominations. First Kings 15, verse 11, and Asa did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord, as did David, his father, and he took away the Sodomites out of the land. You're wondering why I said that the Sodomites should be eradicated? Well, in the Bible, when Asa did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, he took away the Sodomites out of the land and removed all the idols that his father has made. In 1 Kings 22, 46, the Bible says, And the remnant of the Sodomites, which remained in the days of his father Asa, he took out of the land. So his son comes along and says, You know what? My dad didn't quite get rid of all of them. We're going to get rid of all of them. And again, another king that did right in the sight of the Lord. 2 Kings 23, 7, And he brake down the houses of the Sodomites that were by the house of the Lord, where the women wove hangings for the grove. Ezekiel 69, 16, excuse me. I've gone over this verse before, but this is one of the ones that people want to point to to try to tell you that, no, 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 you don't understand. Oh, you're so ignorant. You think God destroyed Sodom. Because, because they're homosexuals, that's not it at all. It's because of their pride or it's because of their um, idleness or whatever, because they weren't hospitable. No, Ezekiel 16, verse 49, because this is where they'll get that from. Ezekiel 16, 49, Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom. Pride, fullness of bread, and abundance of idleness was in her and in her daughters. Now, before we even go any further, why do you think it's called gay pride? Because they are full of pride. Yes, Sodomites are full of pride. Absolutely. That's why these reprobates that want to argue with you online, which I don't get involved with arguing with reprobates, is pointless. It's meaningless. The only people I try to really comment to are the ones that I think maybe have hope. Maybe that there's, maybe they are a believer. But even then, I mean, arguing online is really just ultimately a waste of time. There's a, you'll find a few comments that I've made and I put them up there for posterity's sake, for just so if people are reading the comments to be able to see that there is an answer to a few of these things. It wasn't for necessarily the person I was actually speaking to. But it's not something also I spent very much time doing. I just, it was enough just to put up there. So if other people come and they read, they want to see some type of response, there it is. It wasn't to change that person's mind or get involved in an argument. You'll notice that anytime I put comments up, I didn't do a whole back and forth. I put one or two things up and that's it, done. And it's for that purpose. So I just wanted to explain that. But uh, getting back here at Ezekiel 16, it says, pride, fullness of bread, abundance of idleness was in, her, in her, her and her daughters. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. But then if you read in verse number 50, because they just want to tell you, oh no, it wasn't because of homosexuality. Verse number 50 says, and they were haughty. Again, there's pride. And committed abomination before me. Committed abomination. Leviticus 18, Leviticus 20, abominable abominations. They got rid of the abominable sodomites. Therefore, so it says, and committed abomination for me, colon, therefore I took them away as I saw good. So why did God take them away? Because they committed abomination before him. That is the reason why God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. It's in plain English in black and white. Read it in context. Don't stop at verse 49 which isn't contradictory, by the way, but continue to verse number 50. That does tell you exactly why God rained fire and brimstone down on Sodom and Gomorrah. It's because they committed abomination. Oh, but that's all in the Old Testament. Not all, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. I, th I thought that's what the Bible, oh wait, it does say that. And it says that, you know what it says that in the New Testament saying all scripture, you know what all scripture? That includes the Old Testament. And in fact, at the time that the New Testament was being written saying all scripture, it didn't even include all of the scripture that was to come yet because the, old, the whole New Testament hadn't been written yet. But it's a blanket statement that means all scripture is all the word of God no matter when it was written down, is profitable. 
It all is. But that's okay if you don't want to accept, the, it's not okay if you don't want to accept the Old Testament, but it's in the Old Testament, but it's not just in the Old Testament. It's very much in the New Testament as well. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 6 says, And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemn them with an overthrow, making them an ensample unto those that after should live ungodly. Notice how the most of the references in the Old Testament are about Sodom. That's where the word Sodomy comes from, Sodomite. It's a biblical word, and everybody knows what a sodomite is. And you can look at sodomy in the dictionary, and it may not be a perfect definition, but you know what it's talking about. No one has a hard time understanding what that means, no matter how much someone might want to twist it. Well, the New Testament tells us that what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah, that's an example for people later in life, for people in the New Testament, this is what's going to happen if you decide to do that. This is your example that after, if you want to live ungodly like they did. Jude, verse 7, even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, a man and a woman Lying together, that's not strange. That's natural. That's what God intended. In marriage is what God intended, but, but it's still natural for a man and a woman to lie together. For a man and a man to lie together, that's strange. That's weird. That is unnatural. Going after strange for flesh are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. That's what New Testament says. How about Romans chapter 1, verse number 22? Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections. God says they dishonor their bodies. It's vile, which means disgusting. It'll turn your stomach to even think about it. What do they do? With what, what does God call vile affections? For even their women to change the natural use into that which is against nature, and likewise also the men leaving the natural use. Notice, it's calling it natural for a woman and a man to be together, and a man and woman to be together. That's natural. That's what God created us to be. He didn't create anybody to be a homosexual, to be a sodomite. Not one person, because that is unnatural. That goes against the nature that God gave you as a human being the moment you were born. Or the moment you were conceived. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of women, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meat. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. It's in their mind that's causing them to do it. It's not in their DNA. They weren't born that way. It's a reprobate mind. It's a perversion of their mind that has gotten them that way. I had someone say, well, my boy, I remember going to church and singing, you know, red, black, yellow, black, and white. They're precious in sight. God loves the little children of the world. Sodomites are not a race. And I don't care what skin color you are. I, I'm offended that you're including me as a group of people based on color with a sodomite. Because they're not the same thing at all. A pervert is not just someone who's red, yellow, black, or white. They're a pervert. That's in their mind. The, the color of your skin when you're born, you have no control over that. But see, they want to equate... Hating homosexuality with being a racist. And you know, the media loves to do that too, by the way. They want, oh, well, you guys are just racist bigots. <laughs> yeah. Again, have you been to our church? In our tiny church, 
a tiny church of, of you know, 50 people, you'll probably still find more diversity culturally or, or at least skin color wise than you would in, in the vast majority of other churches. You know what I'm saying? Like it's, a, it's ridiculous. But you know what? We're some racists here because we think homosexuals should be put to death because it's a crime, because they're perverted in their mind. Continuing with Romans 1, verse 29, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers. This whole attribute, this whole list is being attributed to those people that have the reprobate mind. The perverts that they said, you know, men lying with men and women lying with women. This list describes them. This isn't saying that anyone who's ever done any one of these things is a reprobate. This is saying that the reprobate is full of all of these things. That's what it says. Read it again slowly if you don't understand that. That's what the Bible says. Verse 30, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, and by the way, they do. The Sodomite knows the judgment of God, and they hate it. That's why they're haters of God. Amen. Who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things are worthy of death. Oh, wait, what does that say in the New Testament? They which commit such things are worthy of death. Amen. I'm sorry, is that, that's just the Old Testament. No, Romans chapter 1 is very much the New Testament. Amen. They which commit such things are worthy of death. Not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. Show me another reference to homosexuality, to sodomy, anywhere in the Bible and tell me where it's anything to be accepted, tolerated, loved, exalted, given a pride day. I saw someone blaspheme Jesus Christ and say, well, if Jesus were here today, he would lead a pride parade. You pervert. Right. You have no idea who Jesus Christ is. But guess what? You're going to meet him because he's coming back. And if you think he's going to be leading gay pride parades, yeah, he's going to be leading them straight into hell. Yeah, that's right. And he's going to throw them all in there. Amen. And they're going to be locked in there for eternity. That's the big parade. It's the parade to hell. That was point number one. <laughs> I really didn't want this to become a two-parter. <laughs> Is it really that hard to see how God feels about homosexuality in the Bible? Do, do, should we be considering that when we make our laws? In the Old Testament and New Testament says that they're worthy of death. If you're a Bible-believing Christian, how can you deny that? How can you say, well, no, 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 it shouldn't be against the law. Well, should murders be against the law? Well, yeah. Well, well why? Where do you turn to? Show me in the New Testament where the Bible says that murderers should be put to death. All the laws that you want to have, why don't you try to show me in the New Testament? Because that's all they want to turn to. Oh, well, that's the Old Testament. Well, then why don't you prove from the New Testament why you should have all the laws that you want to have right now? You won't be able to do it. You know why? Because you need the whole Bible. Because God gave the law in the Old Testament. Now, you may find some things repeated. We actually happen to see homosexuality and the death penalty being repeated in the New Testament. As much as people want to say, oh, but Jesus didn't say that. You know what? Jesus is the Word made flesh. Amen. And if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, and you better believe the Word of God to be true and holds just as much authority in the book of Romans, in the book of 1 Corinthians, in the book of Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, it holds authority because it's the word of God. Amen. We don't just look for the red letters and say, that's what I believe. We believe it all. Jesus embodied the word of God in its entirety. I really am going to try to get through these other comment, these other 
um, objections very quickly. Hate the sin, love the sinner. Always thrown out there. A quote from Gandhi. That's where it comes from. Now, I do want to make this point, though, because the reason why a lot of these things are, are brought up is because oftentimes there is some level of truth. There is some, some degree of truthfulness in the statements. When people say, you know, hate the sin, love the sinner, that's not exactly what the Bible says. It's, def it's not what the Bible says. However, the Bible does talk a lot about hatred and the vast majority of time, and generally speaking, we should not hate. That definitely is something that should not characterize a person. That is wrong. It is, it is one of the works of the flesh is hatred. Okay? We understand how we should hate or if we should hate based on the entirety of Scripture. But in general, we shouldn't be hateful people. We should be loving. We should love the lost. We should love the sinner, all generally speaking. And you know what? We do. This is why we love someone enough to tell them the truth of the gospel, to tell them about hell, to tell them about Jesus, to tell them the truth, not to lie to them, not to lie to someone and say, well, hey, it's okay. You could just do whatever you want. And you're just fine. You can follow whatever God you want and you'll go to heaven because we're all worshiping the same God anyway. That's a lie. And anyone who's going to say that to someone hates that person because they're damning them to hell by not telling them the truth. We do love people. We're going to tell them the truth. Now, but like I said, we, should, we shouldn't just be character. And that's why I even said I'm glad they actually included that in the, in the, the, the news story where I said that we're not, you know, that doesn't characterize us because it doesn't. Because if you've been to our church, anyone who's actually been here, again, not the people who just want to judge without, with, just by seeing one sound, sound bite, the same people that want to say judge not are the ones judging us based on some sound bite and not hearing the whole thing in its entirety. The Bible says, He that answereth a matter before he heareth it is folly and shame unto him. So generally speaking, we should not hate. However, there are times when hatred is justified. There are times. It's the exception to the rule. And we, we all need to remember that, too. It's the exception to the rule. But you know what? There are things that it's right to hate. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes 3.8, a time to love and a time to hate. A time of war and a time of peace. That there's a time for everything. So there is a time to hate. And there's also a time for love. Second Chronicles 19, verse number 2, the Bible says, And Jehu, the son of Hanani the seer, went out to meet him and said to King Jehoshaphat, Shouldest thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? Therefore is wrath upon thee from before the Lord. So people say, well, you need to love everybody. Well, you know what? There's an example of the Bible of someone getting wrath from God, of God getting angry with that person because they loved someone they should not have loved. They loved someone they weren't supposed to love. They loved someone that hated the Lord. Now this goes back to, again, I want to get real deep into this. This isn't your average unbeliever. We saw in Romans 1, what's one of the attributes of the, of the sodomite, of the reprobate? Haters of God. Someone who's rejected of God has the attribute of being a hater of God. And the people that Jehoshaphat helped, the person, the people, they, they were reprobate. You don't, you don't go loving on them that hate the Lord. Wrath is upon them. And in Psalm 139, verse 21, the Bible says, Do not I hate them, O Lord, that hate thee? And am not I grieved with those that rise up against thee? I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them mine enemies. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. The Psalm of David. Who does he hate? Those that hate the Lord. Why did Jehoshaphat have wrath on the Lord from him? Because he loved those that hated the Lord. Now we love our enemies. Our enemies, someone who does us wrong, someone who might be an adversary to us, we love that person. But just because they're your enemy doesn't mean they're, they hate God. Doesn't mean that they're an enemy of God in, in that sense of, of, of being a reprobate. You can have adversaries, you could have enemies that are your enemies because they oppose you and they stop and they don't like you. 
But it doesn't mean that they hate God. So we love our enemies because we're instructed to and it's the right thing to do. But we see the exception of the perfect hatred being those that hate the Lord. I hate them with a perfect hatred. And you won't find very much um, in the Bible about this in general. Why? Because it is the exception. Because overwhelmingly, we should be very loving and forgiving and long-suffering and merciful the same way that God has those attributes. I mean, put this in perspective. God is love. The Bible says that. It's very clear. Absolutely, God is love. And people will say, well, don't you know God is love? Yes, he is love, yet God casts people in the lake of fire. Now you tell me, is it loving to throw somebody into a lake of fire and brimstone that burns forever and ever and ever and they have no rest day or night? That is not loving. That's not what a love, that's not if you love someone, you don't do that to them. Okay? I know this is a kindergarten, a preschool, right? You don't throw someone that you love into a lake of fire. God doesn't love the people that he throws into the lake of fire. He loved them, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Absolutely. Absolutely, God wanted that person to get saved. God wants and wanted everybody to get saved at one point. But when they reject him, when they don't accept his son, when they don't accept what he did for them, when they don't accept the truth, there gets a point where he loves them no more. And for the unsaved person, definitely the day they breathe their last breath, they don't have any more choices. They don't have any more options. God doesn't love that person anymore. When they die without Christ, they're getting sent, they're getting cast into the lake of fire. And people like to say, oh, well, it's not God putting them there. They send themselves there. No, no. I mean, I understand what you're saying, that they had a choice, yes. But nobody is willingly jumping into the lake of fire. Yep. Nobody would do that. I'm not going to be like, well, I'm just going to reject Jesus, so I'm just going to go, whoop. <laughs> Here I come, hell. No, God is throwing them into the lake of fire. That's what it says in Revelation chapter 20, that they're cast into the lake of fire because they don't want to go there. So yes, God is sending people to hell and casting them into hell. But he's love. He's love because he did everything for them except force them to believe. So absolutely he's love, yet he also does hate and has hatred. He's long-suffering. He's merciful. We see that over and over in Scripture. Why we praise God for that. That is what characterizes God. And thank God for that. And that's also what should characterize us as children of God. And I would say, you know, anyone that knows me knows I'm not some hateful person. But the people who want to hear one little soundbite, oh man, you're just hate preacher, hate this, hate that. Why don't you come and spend some time with me? Why don't you come and spend some time in our church and see how hateful we are? Yeah, we're some, you know. We're, I challenge anyone, spend some time in this church and you tell me, do we look like someone that should be labeled hate group? Come to church service. Come and sit down and, and see. Oh man, we're so hateful. You know what? Yeah, there are some things we hate, but you know what? There's some things that you hate too. And if you say you don't hate anything, you're a liar. Everybody hates something. You just want to tell me that your hate is justified and mine isn't. What about all the people who hated Saddam Hussein? They're a hate group because they hate, right? See how easy it is to just make a broad brush statement and just say, hate group. Oh, wait, but I'm not a hate group. Osama bin Laden, hate group. Oh, you hated him? All you Fox News Republicans? Christians? No, oh, we're going to bomb America. Hate group. Yeah. It's easy to, to, to make the label and make that broad statement and then to scare people. It is a scare tactic to make that broad brush statement. Hate group. It's something that they're afraid. They're afraid of us growing. So you know what they're going to do? That's why 
They want to put hate group label on our church because they want to make sure that people don't come here and actually hear the truth and actually see for themselves who we are and what type of church we actually are. Because we shouldn't be characterized by hate. We are not. Anyone who knows our church, we're, we're not characterized by hate. Why do you think we're going into the nursing homes? Why do you think we're doing everything that we're doing to reach out to people and give them the, the gospel of Jesus Christ? It's not because we hate them. There is a small, small percentage of the population that, yes, we do hate. Those that hate God. And if you, if you love God, if you love the scripture, if you're going to follow the, the scripture in context, get all of it, you should understand that you should too if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to close. I'm not going to finish all of my points. I'm going to get to point number three. Just because this is the last important point I wanted to get across it anyways. What I call the sodomite Christian. So what do you mean the sodomite Christian? I didn't think sodomites were Christian. They're not. It's the attitude of the sodomite that has infected Christianity. The reason why I call him a sodomite Christian, turn if you go to Genesis chapter 19 real quick. These are the ones that blanket statement, judge not. Judge not. Oh, you can't judge. Don't judge. Well, I hear that all the time. Why do you, why do you call that a, a sodomite Christian? Well, because in Genesis chapter 19, when Lot spake out against the homos, in his town, the homos said, judge not, don't judge me, who are you to judge? Yep. That is the exact context, we're going to read it. Look at Genesis 19, verse number 5, And they called unto Lot and said unto him, Where are the men which came in to thee this night? Bring them out unto us that we may know them. Now, the Bible is not explicit in areas where it ought not to be. God understands uh, the proper language to use with people because his word is holy. So it uses euphemisms oftentimes, and I'm not going to explain all of this, but when it says that we may know them, they're talking about knowing him intimately, knowing the men that came in in an intimate way, the way that you'd be intimate with your wife or your husband. That's what they wanted to do. With these men. So the men come to his door and say, hey, bring out those men to us. And Lot went out at the door unto them and shut the door after him and said, I pray you, brethren, do not so wickedly. So what does he do? He says, what you want to do is wicked. What you want to do shouldn't be done. You are being wicked. Don't do it. And what are we saying? Homosexuality is an abomination. It's wicked. It's vile. It shouldn't be done. In fact, the Bible says that those people should be put to death. Well, who are you to judge? Oh, does the Bible say to judge not? Well, when Lot said that, do not so wickedly, verse number nine, the Bible says, and they said, stand back. And they said again, this one fellow came in to sojourn, meaning this just to stay with him temporarily, and he will need to be a judge. Oh, this guy just came in to stay with us. Now you're going to be a judge? Well, who are you to judge us, Lot? You're just a visitor here. What do you mean you're going to judge us? That's the attitude the Sodomites had. Shame on you, Christian, that's going to have the Sodomite attitude. Oh, well, who are you to judge? Lot was right to judge. You know what? God came and did the actual judging of burning those wicked reprobates with fire and brimstone. Yeah, he was right. The Bible says that God delivered just Lot. That he was just. He was a saved man. The Bible also says in Genesis 18, when Abraham was pleading with him to spare the city, hey, if you find 10 people, Ten, just ten people that are saved in that city. Ten righteous people. Will you spare it? God said, yep, I won't destroy it if there's ten people there. An entire city, 
There's not even 10 people who are saved. If I had to guess, I'd say there's probably one. We know it was Lot. We don't know about anyone else. We don't know about his wife, his daughters, or anyone else in his whole family. Don't know. But we know it wasn't 10. I'll read these scriptures for you about judging. Because people want to say, oh, didn't the Bible say judge not? Yeah, Matthew chapter 7. You probably didn't even know that. Matthew chapter 7, the Bible says, judge not that you be not judged. For with what judgment you judge, ye shall be judged. And it goes on to explain that don't judge hypocritically. So if I'm living a secret life of being a sodomite and going out in this filth and perversion, you're right, I shouldn't judge. But guess what? That's not happening. <laughs> it's not even close. If I'm out committing adultery and I say, hey, it's wrong to commit adultery, that's a hypocritical judgment. I've got a beam sticking out of my eye, which is what Matthew 7 is talking about, okay? It's saying how to judge in Matthew chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Let's look at some other areas. Let's say the judge. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. I'll read these for you. 1 Corinthians 5. 1 Corinthians 6. 1 Corinthians 5. 1 says, It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. Isn't it interesting? Now we're talking about another sexual sin. Oh, wasn't well, it in your business anyways what people do behind closed doors? Well, I believe God's word. I believe the Bible. And if someone's going to judge things According to what the Bible says, then I think that's right. Uh, verse number two says, And ye are puffed up, and have not rather mourned, that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from among you. The guy that did this needs to be cast out. Verse three, For I verily as absent in body, he said, I'm not even there, he says, but present in the spirit. Spiritually, I'm with you. I'm with the church. But you know what? I'm, I'm physically, I'm not there. Have judged already. Oh, who are you to judge, Paul? Well, Paul's speaking on the inspiration of the Holy Ghost when he's saying these things to the church, when these things are being written to them. I've judged already because judging isn't bad. It isn't wrong. It's only wrong when you're a hypocrite when you do it. As though I were present concerning him that hath so done this deed in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ when you are gathered together and my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ to deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Well, there's some judging in the Bible, in the New Testament. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse number 1, Dare any of you, having a matter against another, go to law before the unjust and not before the saints? Do ye not know that the saints shall judge the world? Criticizing people for going to law to the judges of the state, as opposed to judging things in-house, in the church. <gasps> you mean a Christian should judge? Yeah, they're being rebuked for going to before heathen to get judgment instead of judging within the church. And if the world shall be judged by you, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Is it really that big of a deal to judge that the sodomites are wicked and wrong and reprobate? I think that's a pretty easy judgment to make. Yeah. Know ye not that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? We're going to be judging angels one day. How much more then should we be able to judge the things that happen in this life? Of course we should be able to judge. If then you have judgments of things pertaining to this life, set them to judge who are least esteemed in the church. I speak to your shame. Is it so that there is not, one, not a wise man among you, no, not one, that should be able to judge between his brethren? It's a shame if a church doesn't have somebody that can make a judgment. That is the shame. The shame isn't judging. The shame is not being able to judge according to the New Testament. People are brainwashed. Jesus Christ said, well, Jesus said not to, Jesus said, judge not according to the appearance, but judge righteous judgment. That's what Jesus said in John 7, 24. Judge righteous judgment. That means judge. So do it right, as Matthew 7 says, but still judge. The point of judge not is, is that 
Well, you're going to be judged the same way that you judge. And you know what? If I ever commit sodomy, put me to death. Okay? Put me to death. That's what I want. I want to be judged the way that I would judge. Go ahead and do it. Okay? I'm all for it. Not going to happen, but I'm all for it. Okay? Whatever judgment that I'm going to pronounce here, it ought to come back on me if I'm guilty of the same thing. Amen and amen. Because even if I fall and do something that's not right, then I should receive the same judgment because the judgment is God's and the judgment is right if it's from the Bible. And that's the bottom line. All sin is equal. If all sin is equal, why is our law given that has different punishments for different crimes? If it's all equal. Why wouldn't they all just have the same exact punishment? Why were some sins considered crimes when other sins, sins had no earthly punishment? Not every sin is a crime, according to the Bible. There is no punishment or penalty for drunkenness, yet it is a sin. God never instituted a, 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 a law, a, a punishment that needed to be meted out if somebody is found guilty of, of being drunken. But it's definitely a sin. God gave us the laws. All sin is not equal. John 19, 11, Jesus answered, Thou couldst have no power at all against me except it were given thee from above. Therefore, and this is when he's talking to Pilate, therefore he that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. Well, Jesus himself said that there's someone who sinned more. He had a bigger sin than what Pilate did to him by condemning him to death. Judas, who betrayed him, sinned more, had a bigger, that is a bigger sin on Judas than it was on Pilate. That's what Jesus said. So when you just want to say sin is sin and all sin is equal, no, it's not. Then you're calling Jesus Christ a liar. Yeah. Because if you're saying sin is sin, then you're saying that what Pilate did and what Judas did is equal. Jesus said, no, it's not. What Judas did is worse. It's the greater sin. Don't you come at me with your stupid, ignorant, lack of knowledge self saying all sin is sin just because you've heard it repeated all your life. It doesn't make it true. Read the Bible. Study it. Think about it critically. Psalm 86, 13, for great is thy mercy toward me, and thou hast delivered me, my soul from the lowest hell. Yeah, there are, there are levels of severity in hell also, the lowest hell. Matthew 23, 14, again, the words of Jesus Christ, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayer. Therefore, ye shall receive the greater damnation. It's going to be worse for you in hell than other people, ye Pharisees, ye hypocrites. That's what Jesus said. If all sin is equal, then how could they receive the greater damnation? It would be the equal damnation. I'm not going to, I'll do this another day. The woman taken in adultery. We're out of time. Those are some of the most common points or arguments, criticisms that people want to make. The reason why I went through them all is to have one resource. If you know somebody that you believe is saved but has given you, you know, using one of these arguments as to, as to why we're wrong. You've got plenty of scripture to point out why, no, you're just repeating something that you probably haven't even thought about all the way through and is not what the Bible teaches. If you love God, love all of his word. Even if it tells you to do things that you've never really heard before, but it's in the scripture. There's a lot of people who go to church their whole life and never, uh, there's, there's people who go to church their whole life and don't even know how to be saved. Run into people like that all the time. I don't hate the believers. I don't hate, I mean, you shouldn't, and you shouldn't either. You shouldn't hate any brethren. But they're doing a disservice by repeating things that are not true and not standing with the people of God against the, the people who are vile and doing abominable works.
They need to be rebuked and corrected and shown what the Bible actually says. Let's bow our eyes have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for the clear instructions from your word. God, I pray that you would please help us to um, continue to preach the gospel, to continue to just stand strong on your word, not to be um, discouraged by this world and the attacks that might come, Lord, but help us to strengthen one another. And Lord, help us to reach the ignorant believer out there that, that has just been brainwashed by the world and um, just hasn't even heard maybe the, the, the truth explained. I, I pray that you would please help, help us and others to have a spirit of not answering a matter before we hear it, but seeking out a matter and being diligent to uh, search the scriptures daily as the Bereans did, whether or not these things were so, and that uh, you would give us that same spirit. Lord, help us to, um, to be able to question everything that we hear and um, be able to see whether or not your word teaches that. And, uh, and we thank you for giving us the Holy Spirit to guide us into all truth and wisdom. And Lord, uh, help us this afternoon as we go out and preach the gospel as you've commanded us to do. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.